share the announcements on the Higher Way Church Jones Memorial United Methodist upcoming 60th anniversary celebration. There's going to be a drive through parade, virtual broadcast of the family video tributes, the Marcus D. Wiley virtual comedy show, and our Sunday morning worship. Join us on Saturday, September 19th for our drive through parade honoring Ms. Maddie Morris and Ms. Margaret Hall, our two remaining charter members. The lineup is 12.30 p.m. Parade starts at 1 p.m. at Living Faith Church, formerly known as Jones Memorial, located at 4310 Holloway Drive, Houston, Texas, 77047. Although not required, everyone is encouraged to decorate their cars. The Family Video Tribute submission deadline is August 31st. Go to www.tribute.com backslash 60 and upload your video to be broadcasted on Saturday, September 19th at 5 p.m. That's not all, church. The Marcus D. Wiley's virtual comedy show is Saturday, September 19th at 6.30 p.m. on YouTube at The Higher Way. Join us on Sunday, September 20th for our 60th church anniversary's virtual worship service at 11 a.m. We are Sydney and Imani and we approve this message. I have one desire of the Lord. That's what I can win on.
Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, saints. Good morning, good morning, good morning again. It is another week completed and another week to, com to, to, to prepare for. Hey, this is the call to worship, and we welcome you into this time. We welcome you. We ask that you get your hearts ready, get your minds ready, and let everything just flow into your households and through the stream and be prepared for this wonderful and amazing praise and worship.
saints of God, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for just being faithful. We thank you, God, for loving us. We thank you for keeping us, God, through the difficult times in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can give you praise through all circumstances, that we can trust you, that you are faithful, Lord. We thank you for life. We thank you for loved ones. We thank you for family. We thank you for community, God. We thank you for employment. Lord, we know in all of these things that you keep us, oh God. But we know just not doing the good things, oh God, that when we're going through difficult times in our lives, you are with us. When we are going through death in our lives, God, you are with us. When we are in loss of a job, oh God, a transition, you are with us. You are our provider, Lord God, and we thank you. Lord God, in every moment and circumstance in our lives, we trust you. We surrender it all. We turn it over to you. Help us to do your will, O God. Use us as you created us to be, O God. Send us out as vessels, as conduits, as light, as salt and light, O God, that you've called us to be. And Lord God, even in this season of COVID, Lord, we just pray for our people. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for those that we don't even know. God, that you would touch us, that you would heal us that you would protect us, that you would cover us, that the blood of Jesus would be upon us, O oh God, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Give us peace, Lord God, where there is disruption, where there is disturbance, O oh Lord. Give us peace. Give us a sound mind, O oh God, where there is weariness. Give us rest where there is anxiety. Lord God, give us hope when there is despair. God, continue to pour out your Holy Spirit. We lift up the families that have suffered loss in this time, O oh Lord, knowing that we can't replace those persons that they love, O oh Lord, but we can love them with the love that you've given us, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would comfort them, would keep them, O oh God, and we trust you. We trust you, O oh Lord, that you would be with us in every moment and situation of our lives. But Lord, help us to recognize where you are. Help us to recognize where you're present. Let us be sensitive to who you are. Let us learn your word so we know your voice. Open our ears, open our eyes, and open our hearts that we may receive you. In the mighty and matchless name of Christ, we pray. Amen. How we hardly say his name anymore. Well, I think it's strange how we love to jump and shout. But never want to tell the world what it's about. I'm amazed at the one that gave his life. It's not a feature of Every single night I think it's sad How the man Who paid the price Is being drowned out By all the perfect lights Bless the temptation Back where it belongs Back upon
uh, to the body of Christ. Uh, I'm Pastor Levingston, and it's a great opportunity for me today to be with you in worship. We're grateful uh, for the ways in which God has blessed us and kept us. We are mindful that for everyone who got up this morning, it, it was also a day of sorrow and sadness because those that you deeply love are not here with you this morning. I want you to know that we're praying for you and lifting you up. We believe that God is with you and for you and not against you. I want to thank God for the praise and worship today, for the music that reminds us that God is to be celebrated. For those who are behind the cameras, who are doing work for the kingdom of God, we just give God praise, honor, and glory. I thank God for all of you who are joining us uh, by, via live stream, whatever platform that is. Thank you for being a part of worship today. Thank you for praying for us and lifting us up, sharing us with other people, and giving us an opportunity to be a small part of the blessing that God is doing in the world. Today, I want to preach the gospel uh, about this, un this little story that's only found in the gospel of Luke, and I, I call your attention to Luke's gospel, chapter 16. I want to read for your hearing verses 19 through 21. Hear this word reading today from the New International Version. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Let us pray. Lord God, your word is alive. It is intended to create in us disciples who will follow you so that those who are believers, God, might be strengthened in our faith, strengthened in our belief, strengthened in our understanding, and we might be willing to go out into a world and still proclaim that the Jesus who came down from heaven is still with us now. So, God, I ask you, to bless those who hear the word today, bless those who share in whatever way in which they find themselves, for those who are in their homes with their families, let your, may your family be blessed. For those who are with us and you're in memory care facilities or you're in long-term care facilities or you're in the hospital, we thank God for your presence today. If you're in your car riding a bike, drive, whatever you're doing, and God has brought us together today, we give God praise, honor, and thanksgiving. Let us not squander this moment, this opportunity to let God's Word speak to all of us, both preacher and people, both those in the pulpit and those in the pews, those who are in the sanctuary and those who are seated at home. God, we give you praise today. We want to lift you up, God. Let your Word be clear. Let your Word be clear, God. Let it convict and convince and confirm the truth of the Word of God for the people who are searching for truth in this life. And God, I will be so careful because I am aware of my sin, my inadequacy to proclaim your word, God. And yet you choose us who understand our weakness to proclaim boldly that Jesus Christ lives. And so, God, I give you honor and praise. And all the people of God said amen and amen. Today I want to preach from this subject, a rich man and the other Lazarus. The, a rich man and the other Lazarus. Most of my life in the life of the church, I grew up knowing a story about a guy called Lazarus. I, you find his story prominently in the Gospel of John. You see Jesus spending so much time with him. But there's another story about a man named Lazarus, only found in this one place in the Bible, in the Gospel of Luke. He doesn't get quite as much attention as Lazarus. After all, that Lazarus was Jesus' friend. That Lazarus, we know Jesus loved him so much that Jesus wept. That's John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept because of the heartache and the pain and the suffering of Lazarus' family, even though Jesus understood that a miracle was about to take place. That Lazarus got up from the grave at the word of Jesus. And so we remember that story. So often our stories aren't remembered. So often our stories are just pushed to the side. You may be sitting there or standing there doing something today and wonder, why are you important? Who knows your story? Does God really care what's going on in your life? There's another difference between these two stories. The story of Lazarus raised from the dead is the story of a real man. 
a person in the flesh who lived his life. When Jesus tells us this little story about a, a rich man and the other Lazarus, it's a parable. It's a parable, a story told so that we might learn lessons from it, so that we might be able to live in a way that's pleasing to God. Parables are not real life. Parables are, are things that give us an example, a way of living our life. But they don't predict everything. We have agency. We have the ability to hear a parable and say, hey, what does that mean to me? What does it mean in my life to live in this way? And so Jesus tells us this parable. He says there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen every single day. He lived in luxury. And then he says there's also a beggar man, a man laid at the gate who has nothing in this life. And Jesus puts these two people before us as two ways of living in this world, two ways of being in this world. And by the way, Jesus is uniquely qualified to talk about wealth and poverty. Jesus is uniquely qualified to talk about wealth and poverty and being poor because Jesus understood them both. Jesus is the king of the universe. Jesus understood what it was to have everything, remember? The psalmist writes in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, and the world, and they that dwell therein. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. The writer of Colossians tells us that he left heaven in all of his glory, div div divested himself of everything but his divinity, and came into the world came like you and me. Jesus knows what it is to have wealth untold. Jesus knows what it is to have all power between heaven and earth in his hands. Jesus knows what it is to speak and his word brings into being. Jesus knew what it meant to be in charge, to have power and authority. But Jesus also knew what it was to be poor. You, you remember Jesus was born in the poverty Jesus was born so poor that when Mary and Joseph went to the temple to make a sacrifice for their firstborn child, to make a sacrifice for Jesus, they couldn't even afford a lamb. They brought a turtle dove, a pigeon. They brought the least expensive offering they could bring. Jesus understood what it was to be poor. Jesus tells us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, about verse 20, Jesus says, foxes have holes to crawl into birds have nests but I have no place to lay my my head Jesus knew what it was to be homeless Jesus knew what it was to be dispossessed and in a world where people have been dispossessed by storms and tornadoes where people are worried even today about the next hurricane the next uh, the depression in the gulf whether they will lose everything Jesus knew what it was to be on the move Jesus knew what it was to have to depend on other people I wish I had some Bible readers here Jesus knew what it was not to have the things that he wanted in life. You remember, he was always borrowing other folks' stuff. Jesus borrowed a boat so he could step out into the water and preach and teach. Jesus had to borrow some bread to t so that he could work a miracle. Jesus always was there. Jesus understood both what it was to be rich and what it is to be poor. And Jesus chooses to share this parable with us because Jesus understood his mission in the world. And too often in the church, we don't understand our mission. We don't remember what we are commissioned to do. You remember Jesus? In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, when Jesus goes to the temple in his hometown, to the synagogue, and Jesus stands up to read, and he opens up the scroll, and he goes to Isaiah, and he reads in the fourth chapter of Luke, verse 18, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus understood that he came into the world to preach good news to the poor. Yes, those who are economically poor. Yes, those who don't have the material things of this world. But Jesus also came to preach to those of us who are poor in our faith, poor in our understanding. We may have everything in the world, but we're poor in love. We're poor in kindness. We're poor in mercy and justice and compassion. We are poor when it comes to treating people the way God would call us to treat. Let, let me just share this. Maybe you'll, you'll hear me. When Jesus was interviewed on the record 
on the record by Bob Woodard, on the record. Jesus said, I know what I come to do. I care about poor people. He didn't simply dismiss them and dismiss the reality of inequity in the world. Jesus understood that as long as we treated people differently, as long as those whom God had blessed with much were unwilling to share with those who have nothing, that we would always be in a world where broken.